This is White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Our vision is to provide a place for hurting, broken people to find love, forgiveness, and encouragement. A place to help develop people to spiritual maturity through Bible study, training courses, and small group ministries. A place to help every believer discover their God-given gifts, talents, and callings. It's our desire to strengthen families and to be a blessing to all who come our way. And now, White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Come let us worship the King. Come on. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. Come on. See how His love overcomes. Lord, you've done great things. Yes. He has done great things. Oh, oh, we look up heaven. You come to the grave. You free every captain and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior. Your name is. your neighbor say God has God will you know there's somewhere an interim there though isn't it we're always living in that interim aren't we where we look back and we say God has and then we have to look and say I know God will and in the interim we've got to keep the faith we've got to sing and praise God the psalmist in Psalm 30, it's a psalm of King David. It's a praise for deliverance. And here's what he said. He said, I will extol you, O Lord. Number one, for you have lifted me up and have not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, 
my God, I cried unto you. Number two, you have healed me. Oh Lord, you have brought up my soul, number three, from the grave. You have kept me alive, number four, that I should not go down to the pit. And here it is. Sing unto the Lord, O you saints, and give thanks, I love this, at the remembrance of his holiness. He's remembering what Jesus has done for him. He's remembering what God has done for him. He's kept him alive. He, he, he sustained him in the midst of it. And the psalmist says this, in the middle of it, he says, sing unto the Lord, O you saints, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And I love verse five, God will. Look at your neighbor and say, God will. God has done it. God is doing it. And God will do it. I love this. For his anger endures, but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. I love this. Oh, hallelujah. But joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. God is the God that's done it. God is the God that's doing it. Hallelujah. And God is the God that is going to do it. Even in 2023, God is the God that is going to do it. Oh, I praise you, Lord. Come on. We're going to sing to it again. Yes. Hallelujah. The psalmist said, oh, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Hallelujah. Waiting. Waiting for change to come. Knowing. Knowing the battle's won. For you've never failed me. For you've never failed, failed me yet. Hallelujah. Your promise still stands. Let's sing it. Come on. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still, come on. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. failed me yet oh I praise you come on everyone let's sing it I know the night come on I know the night won't last come on your word your word will come to pass my heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still in us come on oh Jesus you're
He, the spotless Lamb of God, the perfect one, laid his life down for the imperfect, the defiled, the sinful. He laid his life down for us so that we might live today. Our victory is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. Our praise and worship is in Jesus. It's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Come, on, name another king like this. Now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in a victory. Name another king like this. There's never been a love so great. Come on, he died so we could live. Then he rose up the disobedient before the Holy Spirit said to anoint you right now under the power of the Holy Spirit be healed in the name of Jesus 
function and let your latter days be full of joy be full of joy says the Lord and let it be a time of joy fear not my daughter for I've healed you and I've been with you I've been with you through the darkness of the night but you are coming into my marvelous light the Lord says right now in Jesus name right now in Jesus name would you lift up your hands today if there's anybody that needs healing today lift up your hands today come on lift them up say I receive I receive I receive come on I receive I receive how do we wait one second one second one second one second I receive I receive one second stay right here brother come here come here come right here right now the Lord is doing something right now right now if you lift up your hands right now in Jesus name Declare right now your healing. Right now. There's power right now in Jesus' name. Right here. There's a faith that there's been a faith influx in this room. I've just sensed it from the very beginning. There's been an influx of faith. I believe there's a gift of faith, Lord, right now moving. You know, the gift of faith is one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's something a little bit different than just your average measure of faith that everybody has been dealt with. But the gift of faith is a, a gift right now that God is saying, and the Holy Spirit is saying, receive. So if you need a miracle right now, I don't, I can't, there's no way we can lay hands on everyone in here. God is going to do something in a moment. But if you right now receive, just come on, begin to say, I receive. I receive God's miracle working power right now in Jesus' name. I declare it. I receive it. It's good for me, God. I've been believing it. I know that God has. I know that God will. And I know that He is going to be faithful to perform that which He has spoken over me. He's going to accomplish His good work in me. I know God's plan for me is that I walk in healing. I know that God's plan in me is that I walk in stability of my soul, my mind, and my will, and my emotions. I know that God is planning for me that my blood line up in the name of Jesus. Lord, right now we pray, Lord, for Carolyn Brummett, Lord, right now. In Jesus' name, you see her right now in the hospital room, Lord. We speak to her kidneys to rise up right now. In the name of Jesus, we speak over her, God, right now. Lord, we speak over Judy Farthing right now, God. Lord, if she's even in surgery right now, Lord, that she would come to know you, God. And not only know you, but Lord, know the power of your healing might, God. In the name of Jesus, God. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the Emerson family, Lord. We pray, Lord, for Deborah Emerson. Lord, and her family, the passing of Roger Emerson, Lord, be with her. Lord, we pray for the Sparks family this morning, God. Lord, the passing, Lord, of Kathleen Sparks. We pray, Lord, for Shannon Trent and Dana and Stan Sparks and the whole family in Jesus' name. Oh, we pray, Lord, for the Lewis family today. We heard of the passing of Nina Lewis, God. Be with that family, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Ron Wallace, Lord. Ron, right where he is, if he's watching right now. We pray in Jesus' name. God loves Ron spiritually, physically, in Jesus' name. How many say, I believe it? I believe it. We want them to come. I want every elder in the church that's here to come and stand. All of our elders. Artisa's come on as one of our elders here in the church. And I appreciate him and Sherba. I love it, this couple. What a tremendous blessing they are to our church, to the gyms, all of you gyms know. But we're going to pray for them as we put him in this office as an elder. He's going to be, him and Sherbert are going to be over the first service. They come to the first service, and I know they're going to do a tremendous job. So I want you guys to just come right around here in front of me. We're going to anoint you both with oil. And we're going to set you in this office as an elder, and we believe that God's just going, it ain't going to be the same after today. Amen. Artis, it's not going to be the same. Sherba, it's not going to be the same. <laughs> Woo! <laughs>
<laughs> Amen. Lord, we anoint them and we set them in this office, oh God, as elders of this church. Touch our teeth, God. Give him wisdom, Lord. Use him for your glory, God. Anoint him, oh God, to do the work that you've set, set in him in to do today. Thank you for this couple, how they worked so good together, God. How sure, but what a blessing she is, God, in the gyms. And Lord, what a change it's made. Touch them both. Let their latter days be greater than their former. I pray strengthen them every day of their life, oh God. Lord, Lord God, let them be like those of old, God. At 80 years old, they could see just as good as they could. They could run just as fast as they could. They could go to battle just like they could when they were young. That's what you can do. In the name of Jesus, touch them right now. Call them a shot of a couple of Anointing, oh God. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody put them hands together and praise them. Woo! Mm. What a good God we serve. What a good God we serve. Artis, I love you. Sherb, I love you. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, dear God. How oh, we bless you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You know, I've had the privilege, folks, of going to their home. And I'll tell you what I was so impressed about when I went into their home. They took me back to their prayer closet. And they have a room that is set aside in their home where they have built an altar there. It's where they, this couple goes every day into that room. It's just a place of prayer. It's not a bedroom, it's a prayer room. And when I came out of there, I thought, thank God for, for men and women who are men and women, a man and a woman of prayer, how they love God. And that impressed me so much about y'all. And it's good. when God sent you here, I knew it was for a purpose. Amen. So I appreciate them so much. And if you ever want to take a safe bus ride, get on the bus with our teeth. I love you both. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you why you're walking through this valley And I can't tell you just how long you've got to stay And I can't tell you why your heart feels so unsettled When this all will change But I can tell you there's something you can lean on It's God's promise It won't bend and it won't break It will keep you when your future is uncertain You're not out of grace When the darkness overwhelms you the fear just won't subside and The questions outweigh answers It's long and lonely nights Friend, you've got to keep on moving He is with you in the valley of despair He won't leave you there He is with you when you think you just won't make it He is right there When you look like hope is lost You're gonna find out He's nothing less than faithful So keep holding on She holding on When the darkness overwhelms you And the fear just won't subside and the questions outweigh answers On those long and lonely nights Friend, you've got to keep on moving He is with you in the valley of despair He won't leave you there He won't leave you there No
darkness overwhelms you, the fear just won't subside. Your questions outweigh answers on these long and lonely nights. When you've got a cheap on moving, he is with you. Yeah, when the darkness overwhelms you, and the fear just won't subside. The questions outweigh answers. On the slow and lonely nights, friend, you've got a chief on moving. He is with you in the valley of despair. He won't leave you there. He won't leave you there. He never leave you. Will forsake you, Jesus' name. Beginning in verse 30, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, He said, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, have made them gods of gold. Yet now, listen what Moses says to the Father. Yet now, if thou, wilt, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Did you hear what Moses said to God? He says, and the Lord said unto Moses, whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Let me stop there. I want to speak to you for a few minutes on the subject of responsibility. Look at your neighbor and say Responsibility responsibility. Last week we spoke about opportunity and we all love opportunity and we look at how God gave the children of Israel opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. You remember he spoke the parable Jesus did about the king who sent out, you know, my son's getting married. We got everything ready. Everybody come. And of course he's talking to the nation of Israel. They wouldn't come. So again, he sent them out. His servants, he said, go tell them, come on, they need to come. Everything is ready. Come on. Again, they wouldn't come. Then they made fun of them. They said, we're going back to do what we want to do, going back to our jobs. We don't care about that. You know, it's like so many people today, we miss so many opportunities in life. And then, of course, we know what happens. They end up killing the servants that he sent out. And, of course, the king, you know, it was retribution. He sent his army this time, and he killed everyone in that city, what they had done. And then the Bible tells us, he said, go out in the highways and bring everybody, the, 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 the good, the bad, everybody. And this is Gentiles, folks. How many of you know we've been grafted into the vine? And he says that my house may be full. And they brought him back. The house was full. But there was one there that didn't have on a wedding garment. And, you know, we talked, you talked last week how there are people go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And, you know, th they don't have a relationship with God. It's just religion to them. They go to church all the time, but they don't have that relationship with God. You know, they support Christianity. If anybody says, what's your religion? I'm a, I believe in Christianity and all that. But when it boils down to it, they're living their own life. They're not really living according to the Word of God. So this is what we talked about last week. We, we talked about opportunity. But we, today we're talking about responsibility. And responsibility is not a word that we hear much about anymore. I mean, we, we love words like privilege, and we love words like freedom, and we love words like rights, our rights. But we, we don't like to talk about responsibility. We don't like to talk about commitment. We don't like to talk about obligation. We don't want, we don't want to talk about duty. But you know, all of these things is what... What, what makes us responsible when we are committed to God and we're committed to doing His work. You know, this is what Christians should be wanting to do. We should want to be people who are responsible and committed and obligated and, and, and do what God calls us to do. This is the kind of Christian we should be. I was reading this one time, and it's entitled, What Kind of Christian Are You? And let me just read this to us real quick this morning. It says, a lot of Christians are like wheelbarrows, unless they're useless unless they're pushed. Said a lot of like canoes, they need to be paddled. A lot of Christians like kites, if you don't keep a string on them, they'll fly away. A lot of like kittens, Sheila, they're like kittens, contented only when petted. A lot of Christians are like footballs, you don't know where they'll bounce next. A lot of them's like balloons, full of wind and ready to blow. A lot of them are like trailers, they have to be pulled along. 
A lot of Christians are like neon lights, on and off, on and off. A lot are like buzzards. They get wind of a stink and hurry to it. Seen that too. A lot of Christians are like wagons. They have a very long tongue. A lot of them are like dynamite, easy to explode. Some are like an inspe- inspector. They, fa- they find all the fault. Some are like a passing train, a lot of noise and smoke. Some are like a seagull. Their lip is heavy laden. Some's like a, sli- uh, a slip knot. The more you pull, the tighter they get. Some are like a kicking horse. You have to keep them well hobbled. Some's like an old car, Brother Cabell. A lot of miles, but they're still running. Some's like a good watch, open face, pure gold, quietly busy and full of good works. Amen? That's the way some Christians are. I read this. I thought it was very interesting. A gentleman was driving, and he, he came to this yellow light and, you know, just in front of him. And instead of running the light, he put on the brakes. He did the right thing. He stopped at the crosswalk. Even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection, this tailgating woman was furious and honked her horn, screaming in frustration. She missed her chance to get through the intersection, dropping her cell phone and her makeup. As she was still in a mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window. She looked up at the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was sent, searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. And after a couple of hours, the policeman, a policeman approached her cell. He opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. And he said this, I'm very sorry for, your, for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, making lewd gestures to the guy in front of you and cussing a blue streak at him. And I noticed that the what would Jesus do bumper sticker on your car. I noticed the choose life license plate. I noticed the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker. And I noticed the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. So naturally I assumed that you had stolen the car. Hello? What are we talking about? Responsibility. You know, when Moses came down from the mountain where he had received the Ten Commandments from God, he found the Hebrew people worshiping a golden calf that Aaron had made. If you look right over here in your Bible in chapter 32, look at verse 21. And Moses said to Aaron, let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. It reads like this. Finally, he turned to Aaron and he demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get so upset, my Lord, Aaron replied. You yourselves know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So listen what Aaron did. So I told them, whoever has gold and jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Wow. Moses demanded an explanation, and he demanded an explanation from Aaron and from his sons, because in Exodus chapter 28, the Bible tells us that these men were set in the office of the priest. And he demanded an explanation. What in the world did you do? I didn't do anything. You know how these people are. I just threw the gold in, out pops this calf. Next thing I know, they're all worshiping it. Wow. What are you saying? I'm saying just as then, we have a tendency to blame others for what we are and for what we do. Isn't it easy to blame others? I am the way I am because of you, Mom, because of you, Dad, because of my husband, because of my wife, because of my children. Come on. Because of that preacher. That's why I am the way I am. See, the message of God's Word is this, that we and we alone are ultimately responsible for what we are. I want you to think about this. We're not always responsible for everything that happens to us, but we are responsible on how we respond to things that happen to us. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Can anybody relate to that? Sometimes it does. But we are responsible on how we respond to the bad things that happen to us. Do we get mad? Do we throw the towel in? Do we get mad at God? Do we say, I'm never going to church again? I don't even believe in prayer anymore. Is that what we do? Do we throw the towel in? 
No, we don't do that. We are responsible on how we respond to bad things that happen to us. And by the way, you've heard me say this many times. I think about about 98% of bad things that happen are self-inflicted. I think we bring them up on ourselves. Over in the book of Amos, the word tells us in Amos chapter number 3, And in verse number one, it says this, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The NLT reads it like this. Listen to this message that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel and Judah, against the entire family I rescued from Egypt. Listen to what he says. From among all, this is God speaking, from among all the families of the earth, I have been intimate with you alone. This is why I must punish you for all your sins. Did you get that? Of all the families of the earth, you're the ones that I came to. You are the Hebrews. You are the chosen people. You're the only ones that I've had an intimate relationship with is what God is saying. You see, responsibility is the key note of Amos' message right here. The word Amos simply means burden bearer. It means burden bearer, and it's, fitting, uh, it's a fitting name for this prophet because he bore the burdens of, uh, on his heart for the poor and the mistrust of Israel and Judah. It was written in 8th century B.C. And see, at this time, Israel, Israel was, pro- was prospering in every way. The blessings was flowing upon them, and the result was a spirit of this. It was self-sufficiency. We don't need God. We got this. Oh, how blessed we are. You know, Jesus had to deal with some cities that he walked through. And the Word tells us this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20. Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. There were so many towns he went into and he opened blinded eyes. He made the lame to walk. He cleansed the leper. He set the captive free. But in these cities, these towns, you know, the Word tells us that he, because they hadn't repented of their sins, they hadn't turned to God, that he denounced these towns. He said, what sorrow awaits you, O Chorazin and Bethsaida? For Bethsaida, for if the miracles I did in you had been done in the wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off in the judgment day than you. And you people of Capernaum, Capernaum was the city of Jesus. When you go to the Holy Land, right there by the Sea of Galilee is the city of Capernaum. You know what it is? It's a pile of rocks. It's never been rebuilt and because, because what Jesus said about it. Listen to what he said. And you people of Capernaum, you will, be, will you be honored in heaven? Question mark. No. You will go down to the place of hell for if the miracles I did for you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on the judgment day than you. Did you get this? When we don't recognize what God has done in our lives, we have a responsibility, folks, to take inventory in our lives, to remember the times that God touched us, the times he came to our rescue, the times that he healed our body, the times he walked with us when we were walking through the valley of the shadow of death, when God showed up and was there. All we remember when bad things happen is, God, why'd you do this to me? He said, you'd be better off, man, for Sodom than for you. Amen? There was this smug complacency. That word complacency means contentment and self-satisfaction. You ever met anybody who was just self-satisfied? We get a perfect example in the book of Revelation chapter 3. The Laodicean church in verse 14, the angel of the church of Laodicean write, These things saith, Amen, faithful, true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Listen to what the Lord says to this church. I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And listen what they said. Because thou sayest, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. No, it's not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked is what the Lord is saying. I counsel thee to buy me gold that's been tried in the fire. Amen. He says that thou mayest be rich with white raiment that the, listen to this, that the nakedness of uh, 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 do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eyes that thou mayest see us. So the time of Israel was a time of prospering in every way. God was blessing them, and here they have these attitudes. But Amos shattered the complacency of the people with a reminder of their responsibility to God. And I hope this morning, you know, we've been in church, we've prayed, we've experienced the Lord. We could go home, but, you know, there is an impartation that God wants to leave to this church today. And I believe it's this, that we have got to understand our responsibility First and foremost, we have a responsibility to Almighty God. Think about this, folks. 
We have a responsibility to live for Him. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Amen? To live in righteousness toward Him. We have a responsibility to our families. Could I ask this question? How many of you have family members who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Did you know we have a responsibility to be a witness to them? Amen? That they can see Jesus in our life. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of this earth. Where does the witness begin? It begins in Jerusalem. What is that? That's your family. That's your household. I've seen it, folks. In 53 years of serving God, I've seen people trying to win the world, and their families are dying and going to hell. I've seen it in preachers' homes. I've seen it time and time again. The preacher's kids are out there. They don't want anything to do with it because they were never shown love. The, 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 the pastor was too busy trying to take care of everybody else. didn't even take care of his own family. We've got to be a witness. This is our responsibility to God, to our family, to our church, not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Oh, but Brother Ewing, it's been COVID. That's not going to hold up when we stand before God. That's a command not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much more as we see the day approaching, the coming of the Lord. We have that, we have that responsibility. Amen? We have a responsibility to those that we work with. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. But it doesn't stop there. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We've got to love people. Come on, Amos declared that the judgment of God would come because they had lost sight of their responsibility. And we and as a church, when we lose sight of our responsibility, what our gifting and our callings are in our lives, and we're not doing what God's called and commissioned us to do, that's when we're losing out, church. In our relationship with God, think about this. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm privileged. How many of you know if you know Jesus, you're privileged? Look at your neighbor and say, you're a privileged character. Huh? And if there were ever a privileged people in a relationship with God, it was the Hebrew people, the Jews, whom God chose as instruments of grace. He chose them to, and delivered them from Egyptian slavery and bondage. Amen? I mean, with them, he made a covenant that was get, he gave the written law to these people. It was God who ushered them into the promised land after they had been 40 years in the wilderness and 430 years in captivity. These Hebrew people, they were a privileged people. These Hebrews were. But along with the privilege came the responsibility for them to live in righteousness toward God. And that's the problem that God always had with them. They weren't living holy and righteous before Him. He's, listen, Moses is gone. He's up on the mountain to receive the commandments of God. And what are they doing? Even the leadership... I threw this gold out. I pops his calf. What can I say? Are you listening to me? They had a responsibility to live in righteousness before the Lord. In our relationship with God, it's a privilege also to be, say, to be able to say, I'm a Christian and I'm born again. But also with that comes a great responsibility. It comes a responsibility in our relationships with one another. I want you to think about this right now. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. I read this years ago and I thought it was pretty good. It says, to dwell above heaven, to dwell above with saints we love, will be grace and glory. Can somebody say amen? amen? To dwell above with saints we love will be grace and glory. But it went on to say, to dwell below with saints we know, that's another story. How many of you know it ain't supposed to be that way? Amen? The Jews were blessed. But along with the privilege came responsibility to be instruments of grace to others. Matter of fact, the Ten Commandments were the stipulation by which the covenant relationship with, between man and God was to be regulated. And there was not only a vertical dimension, man to man, there was a horizontal dimension, uh, a, a, a man to God. Man to man and man to God, how we're supposed to live. And let me, let me close with this. It's going to help you. I told you I'm not going to be long, and I'm not. But this message has to be preached here today. Over here in the book of 1 John, listen to this now, because this is where we are, church, and this is how we're going to win people to Jesus. The Word says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, look at your neighbor and say, put your ears on. It says, Beloved, who's he talking to when he says beloved? He's talking to the church. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Did you get that? A little something else I want to read to you right here. I thought this was pretty good too. What did he say? He that loveth knoweth not God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I read this. I thought it was pretty cute. It says, a battered old man got up one night during a revival meeting. And he said, brothers and sisters, you know how I, you know and I know I ain't been what I ought to have been. I've stole hogs. I've told lies and got drunk. And always getting in fights shooting craps, playing poker. I've cussed and sworn and run around on my wife. But I thank the Lord there's one thing I ain't never done. I ain't never lost my religion. Hello? And this is the love. The love. What's he talking about? He's talking about love. Amen. This is the kind of love we got to have, folks. Are you listening to me? Are y'all still with me? He said, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It was manifested, the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. And what he's saying here, the NLT reads it like this. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. He sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Did you get that? He said, beloved, if God so loved us, here it is, we ought to love one another. What's wrong with the church world today? We've got people who come and sit on this side and don't want to have anything to do with folks on the other side. We got people that's so full of prejudice. Are you listening to me? This is where we are. We're seeing lawlessness and prejudice like we've never seen before. This thing's getting ready to wrap up, folks. The only way we're going to win this world is to love them. I mean, you can turn on the news and get madder than a junkyard dog. Are you listening to me? But we've got to understand we're Christians. And listen, religious people. They do all the things that this guy was talking about. But people who have a relationship with God, Moses said, if you don't forgive them, blot my name out of the book. The Lord says, those who sin against me, will I blot out of the book. See, we're living in a time now where preachers get up and preach and say, you can't get your name blotted out of the book because once you're saved, you're always saved. You go to the book of Revelation, it says, he that overcometh, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Can you get your name blotted out? You sure can by the way we live, the things we do, the way we treat people. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. How many of you, God's trying to perfect his love in you? Huh? Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit Oh, don't tell me you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're walking around with hatred and unforgiveness in your life. Come on. He goes on to say, We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. How can we have boldness in the day of judgment? Because when we're walking in his love, as he is, so are we. When we get to heaven? No, right here. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. NLT reads this verse like this. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. In 53 years and as a pastor for... Going on 44 years, 
I've seen a lot of people die. I've been in the room when they took their last breath. And I've seen some with a big smile on their face and the glory of the Lord. And I've seen some who were terrified. Terrified. And I'm thinking, oh Jesus. What are you saying? Well, the scripture tells us right here. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Amen? There's no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. We love him, I like this, because he first loved us. Woo! Isn't that an awesome thing that God loves us? He loves you. I don't care what you've done. He loves you. Right? We love him because he first loved us. It, listen, this is it, folks. If we say we love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How can we say that we love God whom we've never seen when we can't love our brother who we see every day? We wonder what's wrong with the church. The last verse says, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Amen? Amen. See, because of the covenant God made with the Jewish people, they had the responsibility to live in righteousness toward God and to, love in, to live in love one toward another. This is how we are to live. We've got to understand that. The only way we're going to win the world is through love. We got to love them out here in this world. We, we don't partake of their sin, but we love them. And we got to show people when they come into this church that we love them. You know, there are people who goes in churches and they walk right out saying, man, whew, nobody even shook my hand. Nobody even told me they loved me. Nobody welcomed me say, we're glad to have you here. Listen, if you're a regular in this church and you see somebody walk through the doors and, and, and you don't know them, it's your responsibility to go up to them, introduce yourself to them, and say, welcome to White Oak. We're glad you're here. Anything we can do for you? Come on. I had a gentleman one time, word got back to me, he made the statement. This was the Full Gospel Fellowship. He said, that's the most unfriendly church I've ever been to in my life. This is what the gentleman said. And I took note of this gentleman. He always came in late, and he always left early. Nobody had even a chance to shake his hand and welcome him. Amen? But we know there's no excuse for us. We've got to let people know that we love them and we care about them. In our relationship with God, we are to live in righteousness and holiness before God. In our relationship with others, we're to live in love. This is our responsibility. To love people. See, we don't know what people's going through. We have no earthly idea what people are going through. It should break our heart when we see family members and friends who are out here and do not know Jesus. It should drive us to our knees that we would pray and fast and seek God like we never had before. We've got to understand that. It's our responsibility to win our families to Christ. In closing, I'll never forget, I read this years ago about a, a young man in New York City. He was on a, standing up on a high rise, and he leaped to his death. He committed suicide. His splattered body was down in the road. People gathered around him. And a gentleman noticed that there was something in the young man's hand. And he went over and he pried his fingers open and he took out a note that the young man had written. And you know, in the note, what it said was this. All I ever wanted was somebody to love me. That's all I ever wanted, just to have somebody to love me. See, we don't know what people's going through. Some of you... You're still carrying things in your life that happened years and years ago. I was talking this morning, a testimony. What's the preacher's name that died this week? Tracy? Preacher, we're we talking about? Dr. Charles Stanley died this week. 
He was raised in this area. We were talking about him this morning before I came out. His biological father died when he was eight years old. And uh, his mother remarried. And his stepfather abused him and his mother. He beat his mother. He abused Charles Stanley, Dr. Stanley. And one day, Dr. Charles Stanley came in and he saw him hitting his mother. And he told his stepfather, he said, If I ever see you lay a hand on her again, I will kill you. This is what he told his stepfather. I will kill you. And their relationship for years, they had no relationship. Said Dr. Stanley was praying and God revealed to him, you're preaching to others to love one another. What about your stepfather? Said he went to his stepfather and he said, I want to apologize what I said to you. Said his stepfather started bawling and crying and put his arms around him and said, I want to apologize to you. And they both made it right. And then, you know what, that relationship was restored. And he was able to preach on love again. What are you saying? I'm saying there are things, you've got broken relationships, there are things that's going on, and you're holding ill feelings toward people. How in the world can you reach out and love others when you've got that in your heart? God wants to heal that. He can heal that. He can take the pain away. He can give you peace. He can give you joy. He can restore your life. And you know what? We'll see a change take place in this church too. Amen? When we make it right with God and we understand we don't want religion, we want a relationship with God. And whatever it takes, I'm going to get that relationship with God. Would you bow your heads this morning? Lord, I love you. I thank you for this tremendous service we've experienced here today. I thank you for these who have been ministered to at this altar. I believe there are things that have taken place today that will last for time and eternity. I believe some people have gotten healed physically and emotionally and financially. I thank you for what you've done today. And I know this message wasn't a shouting message, but it's a message that our church needs to hear. That we've got to be a lighthouse. We've got to shine out to a lost and dying world that there's a God in heaven that loves you and cares for you. And there's a people here that love us that loves and wants to reach out to people and not judge them but love them let them know that Jesus died for them Lord we understand and we know you hate our sin but we also know that you love the sinner you died not for the righteous you died for the sinner and Lord if there's anybody in this service right now that does not know you let them know that that you love them dear God let them know that we love them we're not here to put them down and judge them and point a finger we're here to to put our arms around them and let them know we love them and we care no matter what they've done Lord even after we get saved we're not perfect we've all failed we've all sinned we've all come short we've all blown it at one time or another we've done things if we could go back and change it we would we can't change it all we can do is ask for forgiveness And you said if we come to you with a broken heart and a spirit that's contrite, you said, I I won't turn you away. And Lord, I found that to be true. So Lord, if there's anyone here before we go home that would say, Pastor, I'm not ready. I pray they'll make their way to this altar right now in Jesus' name. With heads bowed, eyes closed. Is there anybody here who would say, I just need the love of God shed abroad in my life, Pastor. I need Jesus. If that's you, would you slip that hand up real high and take it right down. Back down, you're saying, Pray for me when you pray. I'm not coming to you, but I promise you I'll remember you in my prayers. Anybody, 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 anybody. All right, you can lift up your head. I want to tell you something. I want you, church, to take this message, and I want you to practice it every day of your life. Let me close with this. There's a gentleman I read his book years ago. His name... I can't remember. I almost had it and it left. So when you get older, you'll understand that. But I was reading his book and he was talking about Christians. And he was talking about our responsibility that we have. Jamie Buckingham is his name. See, it takes a while 
but it comes back eventually. How I many of you remember Jamie Buckingham? He died maybe 15 years ago, but he had a lot of wisdom. And he made a statement like this, and I thought it was really good. He said, you know, most waiters and waitresses in restaurants said they despise having to wait on a table full of Christians. He said, number one, because they're the most demanding people of all. And number two, they don't tip. I have a lady that I know that works in a restaurant and nobody in there is Christians. And this woman can't even witness to them because they're fed up to here with so-called Christians who demand everything and won't even tip. And many of you know, when you go out into the into the community, you need to let your light so shine. When you sit at the table, that should be the most glorious day that waiter or waitresses have. That's you, they should receive the biggest tip they've ever got. Are you listening to me? What's that called, preacher? It's called responsibility. That's what it's called. So this message is to our church. If we're going to win people to Christ, we get to love them. You don't know what they've done. I don't care what they've done. We get to love them. Amen? Y'all still love me? You're not, if, you don't, if you don't love me, you ain't going to heaven. The one thing I ain't never lost, preacher, I ain't never lost my religion. Come on. Some of you need to lose that.